Hey, this is four-time Black Belt World Champion, Dominika Obelanite. If you guys are looking to level up your jiu-jitsu game with awesome jiu-jitsu courses on mindset, strategy, and beyond, make sure that you guys check out BGJ Mental Models Premium. I myself have a course up there, so make sure you guys check it out. Let's get you guys on that next step in your jiu-jitsu journey. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 223. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach, and I'm happy to be joined for the first time by Thomas Rudzinski. Thomas, how are you doing? Steve, thanks for having me here. Great evening. Good to talk to you, man. Glad to get you on here, and I'm always glad to have a fellow podcaster on. It's usually easier to record with other podcasters because they know how this works, so happy to have you here. But hey, for those who aren't familiar with you, why don't you just give yourself a quick introduction? Absolutely. Well, first, thanks for having me here. It's going to be a great conversation, but as you mentioned, my name is Thomas Rojanski. I'm I'm a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I've been on the mat for about 22 years. Physically, I'm located in Chicago suburbs. So in Midwest, and you know, between the academy and the podcast that I do run, it, it's quite a busy life so far. So I love it. <laughs> I can imagine my my favorite thing about podcasts is how you know everyone thinks this is an easy gig, and you just sit down and record, and then just upload a file. But man, as a, I'm sure you can attest, it quickly becomes a lot more work than you would originally think. You know what? When we started our podcast venture, that's what we thought it would be. We thought it would be just a chit-chatting with people and then we upload and, and you know, there's millions of listeners. And, and the truth is, you know, that there is by far more work behind a project like this. So I do appreciate everything that you do and continue impacting Jiu-Jitsu community. Oh, well, thanks, man. I, I do appreciate it. And hey, on the topic of impacting the jiu-jitsu community, you had a great topic idea. You wanted to talk about maximizing student success. I love that topic. We've been digging recently a lot into things that more impact coaches and how coaches impact their students. And this is something I'm really excited to explore with you here. But maybe as good a place as any to lead off is talk a little bit about your academy and your methods. You know, you've talked about how to maximize student success, and I would love to get kind of a visual into your gym and how you guys run things on the ground. Yeah, I, you know, I think the biggest challenge, you know, in jiu-jitsu in general is the fact that it's such a young sport. And, you know, relatively to, to other sports, whether it's basketball, soccer, or wrestling, or karate, or other martial arts, or any sport for that matter, I feel that it's fairly undeveloped from the educational perspective. And what I mean by that, it's fun. We love it. We love being on the mat. We love training, studying, and sparring. But up to recent years, there haven't been many established methods how to educate students, how to maximize their success, how to increase their success with you know, less impact, less be more strategic about how they learn and what they learn. And then on the top of all this, because jiu-jitsu is so deep and rich with everything that it offers, it's really challenging for a lot of instructors, a lot of academy owners to really get a grasp on this. You know, if you asked, I think, average black belt 10 or 20 years ago, jiu-jitsu was not much more than come on, step on the mat, let me show you a couple moves. I think today when this turn is turning into, very slowly, but it is turning into a professional sport, now we are talking about a little bit more strategic approach, more professional approach. And that even bleeds over to the casual student who might be training two or three times a week. But that's one of the biggest challenges that I think a lot of coaches, a lot of instructors, a lot of Jiu-Jitsu Academy owners are facing these days. So having some strategies around it, I think is is critical, not only to the success of the academy, but also to the success of the students, which as a result will convert into the success of the instructor or the entire organization, if you will. So, you know, at, at my academy, we've done a pretty good job, but it's a growing process of one, understanding educational methods. And what I mean by that 
not necessarily jujitsu related. You know, I, I look at jujitsu as a learning jujitsu as it, it's not much different than learning any other topic. You you have to study it. So you have to analyze it, break it down in some logical, mechanical approaches, and then relate that to the student, you know, and give them all the tools that they need really to comprehend that information and then recall that information at the right time. So, you know, at my academy, you know, we, we've done a pretty good job with structuring this, putting this on a platter, if you will, to the students, especially to the brand new students, where the information is easy to digest, easy to access, easy to recall, and putting them on the best path to one, give them the best vehicle, if you will, to start learning this. Yeah, I really like that mindset. I, I like that you're taking some time to understand that your students are all unique and different and might have different goals. And this is one of the things about jujitsu that is really interesting to me compared to a lot of other sports, especially combat sports. We've been talking a lot to Nick Perler from the Perler Wrestling Academy recently on our premium series. And something that he's brought up is when you're talking about wrestling, especially at the high school level, usually everyone has the same goal. They all get into it because they all want to win. They all want to be champions. But one of the things that's interesting about jujitsu is that students can come into this and have wildly different goals and reasons why they train. Some people come into jujitsu because they want to be a competitor or, you know, they want to feel good about themselves. Maybe they want to improve their confidence. Some people come into jujitsu because they just want to have fun. Some people want to learn self-defense. There's really no one reason why people could come in to do this. And I think that, you know, you talked about how instructor methods have traditionally not been very well developed in jujitsu. I think part Part of that is that up until recently, there's very much been a one size fits all approach from most coaches. But I like what you're talking about, where you talk about how to work with each student to kind of customize and figure out what their goals are and make sure they can succeed. So how does that happen? I mean, if some new student shows up to your academy, what do you do to kind of tease that information out of them? Well, yeah, I think it really all starts with a very simple but important conversation of what do you want to get out of this? It's a very fine balance because one, it's very difficult to cater towards every single student, especially if you have three or 300 or 500 students. It's nearly impossible, right? At the same time, you do have to provide a certain level of customization to cater towards the students that are looking for the confidence boost. You have to cater towards the students who do want to lose weight. You do want to provide the service where students can maximize their educational aspects towards the technical aspect of jujitsu, right? So I think that's one of one of the most difficult things for most of the instructors, not to be cookie cutter. So how do you customize this? Now, and I think this is between offering different level programs, and I don't mean by skill set level, but I mean by how things are presented, right? So perhaps offering a very basic self-defense class, that's one, caters towards one group. Providing a little bit more sport advanced class, that's another group. Providing a service of more of a competitive class, that's another group. And now you are isolating these groups towards, you know, a specific goal. Now, that's not enough. You need to have a developed program. How do you provide the service within each of those groups so people can, or your students can really maximize their success? And I think that's the most difficult part. I think anybody can develop a curriculum and pro put the curriculum on the wall and allow the students to come to the classes a couple times a week and learn from them. I think that's the easy part. But really understanding how human brain operates, really understanding how students receive their information really understand that it's more is beyond just showing somebody five steps and this is the moves that you need to complete. You need to go beyond that in order for your student to really be successful. And understanding how human brain works, that's one. Two, understanding behavior factors. So one person is more visual, the other person is a little more hands-on. A third person wants to drill 150 times. Another person is heavily driven by videos that they watch at home. Knowing your students is going to bring that instructor or those instructors within the academy to by far higher success rate than just having this cookie cutter recipe and providing a cross to everybody. 
Yeah, yeah. And you bring up a great point, too, about how challenging this can be for a lot of instructors to do. I mean, it's it is challenging enough when you've got a small group of people just to remember everyone's name and what they're all about and what they're looking for. But this just becomes harder and harder as your academy scales, especially as you get to the point where you might one day have enough students that you need to hire other coaches. And then you as the head coach might not always be there. So your your problem then becomes making sure that your staff teach consistently in line with the way that you would normally teach, it becomes a a surprisingly complex logistical problem to, you know, like you talked about, to keep in mind the needs of all of these various customers. Do you do anything when people come on board in terms of customer intake? Like, I don't know, is there a form or something that you ask people about in terms of their goals when they come on so that you can better slot them to the program that makes the most sense for them? Yeah, so I, I think I'm fortunate enough where my academy it doesn't have thousands of students, and I personally do it go above and beyond, in my opinion, to really get to know every student who is onboarding. And I mean, hey, listen, it, the moment you get over you know a few hundred students, that becomes really difficult, and and it, it's even difficult for me. But I really try to connect with every single student. So you know, I, I try to be on a mat. 15 minutes before class. Matter of fact, I should be on the mat. I think every instructor should be on the mat as a first person on the mat, you know, shaking hands, saying hello. And those things go very, very far, in my opinion, from the student perspective. So imagine this, if if you walk into the room and there's 50 guys on the mat and nobody says hi to you and you, you are the first one to say hi, how do you feel? But it's a very different scenario when you step in on the mat there was 50 guys on the mat and the instructor is the first one to shake your hand and he actually knows your name and he asks you, how are your kids? How was your day of work? Did you work? Did you, oh, you had a shorter day of work. Good for you. Phenomenal. How did the training go last week? Let's revisit that. I remember that you told me that there was a point of struggle there. Let's make sure we connect on that. You know, those little things, I think, make a huge difference. It's a more of a personal approach to the student. And it's not necessarily that we answering every question, but we making ourselves very, very accessible. And I think that is a first step of really going above and beyond to knowing those people. Yeah, that's actually a good little hack that any instructor can employ. It doesn't even really matter, you know, how good you are at planning out courses, but just being a little bit more sociable. There's a lot of gyms that you show up at and No one there really makes any effort to introduce themselves to new people. Everyone just kind of goes off into their own little corner and does their own thing. And that can make walking into a gym very intimidating if you're a new student. You go in there and if no one says hi, no one wants to talk to you, no one makes eye contact, you're not really giving the impression that this is an inclusive place that really wants you to be there. I went to a Rafael Lovato Jr. seminar recently. He was up here in Vancouver to visit Kabir Bath School. Kabir is one of his black belts, a good friend of mine. He's been on the podcast before. And one of the first things Lovato did is he made a point of going up to every single person at the seminar, introducing himself, shaking their hand, getting to know them a bit, which I thought went a long way. And I kind of wish more instructors would take that approach to make things a bit more personal. I agree with you that that, if nothing else, is going to set the tone and make it easier for any relationship that comes afterward. Yeah, I agree 100%. I mean, it, it's one of the most fundamental items that I think every instructor can do. And one, be empathetic. Two, be approachable. I mean, look, if there is a brand new person walking into the room, whether seminar or a class, and they want to be there because they, if they didn't want to be there, they would not, right? But they are making this effort to come into their room to learn something new. And then there is a large amount of students on the mat. They don't know anybody. They're intimidated. They're concerned of what's going to happen. There's a bunch of unknown. And then there is this person appears. They have a black belt. They are by far more knowledgeable than everybody else. And that's how often black belts are being seen. That by default, in my opinion, makes them very unapproachable, regardless of their personality. Just that that statue, if you will, that that status of being a black belt, being that instructor, really, I think, disconnects the instructors from rest of the group, from rest of the rest of the room. And I don't think it should be that way. I think actually instructors should be very approachable. Instructors should be the one that is, you know, it, it, 
connecting with every single student, the one who is joking with the students, the ones who are really connecting on a very personal level. And don't take me wrong, there's levels to all of this. And, you know, there is a certain signs of respect that should be shown. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of old school in that way, but that's none of that changes that I think instructors should be approaching. I often tell my instructors, there's three things the brand new person does not want to be experiencing when they come into the max. One, getting hurt. Two, being embarrassed. And three, being wrong. The tricky part behind this is that, well, they will be wrong because this is their first day. They will make mistakes. It is what it is. They will be embarrassed because they are doing something brand new that they've never done before. You know, getting hurt is probably the easiest part to eliminate out of that, that trio. You know, if somebody gets hurt, it's probably a, you know, a, a no go at that point, right? So if we remove the getting hurt part and we focus on the other two getting being wrong and getting embarrassed, if we can manage those two in some shape or fashion, they still will be wrong. They still will be embarrassed. But if we can lower that to minimal, or at least make them feel as they are part of something larger and they are fully accepted, it's a win. It's a win. Their experience is by far better and their chances of returning and continuing this on are so much, so much greater. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't happen everywhere. This doesn't happen all the time. And I think that is one of the reasons why a lot of people try jujitsu, but they don't continue it. So this is one of my favorite things to talk about in the sport of jujitsu, which is why so many people quit. And also the psychology of quitting jujitsu, because there's a weird thing about jujitsu, which is that we seem to celebrate the fact that so many people quit. And I think we do it to make ourselves feel better, right? If you train jujitsu and everyone around you is saying something like 99% of the people who show up to class will quit and only the strong survive, then what you're really saying is you think that you are somewhat special because you're one of the 1% that survived. But honestly, if you're looking at things from a sustainability and a business and a growth standpoint, having 99% of your customers drop off is not good. It's tremendously alarming. If this ever happened in any other endeavor, people would be freaking out. I mean, if you ran a company and 99% of your customers left or 99% of your employees left, it would be a disaster. But in jujitsu anyway, the business of jujitsu, we kind of put up this shield where we tell ourselves, well, this is a hard thing to do and some people just aren't cut out for it. But I think honestly, a lot of the problem is just giving people a really bad impression of what jujitsu is. It's like you said, if they show up on day one and the first thing that happens is they get injured or they feel like no one wants them there or made to feel dumb or stupid in front of the group. You know, it, it doesn't matter how tough they are. They're not giving jujitsu a fair shot and they're probably not going to come back. I would want to hear you expand on that and to see if you agree with what I'm saying or if uh, maybe I'm a bit off track here. No, it, there is definitely this stigma behind number of reasons why students quit, right? We have this, this blue belt blues, you know, you get your blue belt, you disappear. You have, you have this whole theory of 99% people who start never get to the black belt, you know, and a variety of others. Those are probably the most common ones, but you're right. From the very beginning, we are painting this picture that this is almost unachievable for most people. And, you know, what's interesting about this is that being on the mat for 20, 22 plus years, I think things are slowly actually improving. When I look back, when I was starting, I was flat out told I will never, ever get to the black belt for a number of reasons, but like, forget about that, that you will never get there. Today, I think by systemizing this a little bit, by making it more approachable, putting some thought into the education side of jiu-jitsu, putting some thought into a business aspect of jiu-jitsu academies, providing it as a true service. I think that is changing very slowly. There are still these old school sayings, they hover over us, you know, and, and I think those present a very skewed perception of what, what jiu-jitsu is. But on the flip side, jiu-jitsu is hard. Jiu-jitsu is complex. Actually, I don't like using hard as a descriptor here. I often say it's complex and it's fun at the same time, but you have to work. You have to overcome obstacles. You have to somehow 
overcome these challenges that you face every single day. And the difficult part about all of this, that jujitsu is almost impossible to track. So one of the reasons I think why we don't see this 99% failure rate in businesses or other sports, because they are very easy to track, or at least they are systemized enough where you can track them. Imagine a swimmer. You're making your laps. There is a certain amount of time that you require to complete in order for you to make the team. You don't make the time. You don't make the team. You make the time. You make the team. It's pretty simple. Cut and dry. It's black and white. Same thing in wrestling. You compete. You win. You make your places. You qualify. In jiu-jitsu, that doesn't exist. It's all skill-based. And it's all progression-based. The unfortunate part is that you and I, we have different brains. We process information very differently. Plus, the expectations of us might be different. Our ages might be different. Plus, we are surrounded by completely different circumstances. I might be a mechanic. You might be a doctor. You might be working, I don't know, 20 hours a week. I might be working 80 hours a week. All of this is moving parts. And all these moving parts, they are not systemized. So how in the world are we supposed to track this? How are we supposed to tell our students as, listen, you are doing good. And they look at the guy next to them and say, well, wait a minute. He's doing by far better than me. Or vice versa. How come I'm not being promoted if this guy is not doing as well as I am? These questions come up every single day in, in academies around the world. And it's challenging to systemize this in that sense, simply because there is no measuring stick. It's very difficult to provide that feedback to the students. Yeah, there's a lot of things about jujitsu that make it very hard to track and measure, like you said. And it, it's very hard to really achieve anything in life if you can't track and measure it effectively. I'll bring him up again. I, when last I was talking to Nick Perler, we just uh, are in the process of putting out another premium episode with him. And one of the things he said was, you know, as a wrestling coach, he's very jealous of a lot of the other sports that are more individual. Because if a sport is is individual, you're basically going to be measured against some sort of objective metric, like how long did it take to finish the track or how much weight did you lift? There's some sort of objective measure that is keyed to yourself. So you can very clearly see if you're getting better or if you're getting worse or if you're plateauing. But in jujitsu, there's so many things that make it hard to do that. You know, the main thing, of course, with jujitsu is your training is completely dependent on the quality of your training partners. Your training partners have an immeasurable impact on how well you train. You know, if, if you'd have partners who just aren't good drilling partners and they make it really hard for you to drill stuff because they always want to spar or, you know, if you have people who are training and maybe they're not aligned with your training goals and they're looking for something different out of the role it can be hard to to really get consistency there. And beyond that, there's different people you got to train with, right? Maybe one day you go in and you feel like a killer because you beat up a bunch of, you know, white belt hobbyists. The next day, some visiting black belt comes in and just smokes you, right? I mean, there, there's a lot of ups and downs and you don't get consistent feedback when you're training all the time. You throw in the fact that so much of jujitsu is subjective, like the whole belt system. You know, you talked about getting to black belt earlier. You know, you talk to 10 different black belts and ask them all what makes a black belt and who deserves a black belt. And you might get 10 different answers back. It's just very hard to measure and track things in jujitsu. And that is one of the things that makes it hard to plot out your growth is because there's no way to measure your growth, really. Yeah. And on the top of it is, you know, you have to add the simple fact where we start taking this entire conversation. The jujitsu is probably the least systemized sport or activity there is out there. You know, there's plenty of academies who don't even have curriculum. The instructors show up in the academy, they scratch their heads and, okay, we will be working on this today. You know, and all of that adds complexity to this entire topic. So I think as time goes on and we put more effort into really understanding how humans learn, how can we systemize this a little bit better? How we can have a clear expectations of our students? Because we didn't even touch that topic. Think about it from a student's perspective. They come in, they train for a year, year and a half, whatever it might be, you know, and it's like they get their stripes on their white belt. And then at some point, they are starting to think about the blue belt. Everybody does. But what is the expectation? Did anybody talk to that student? Did anybody tell them, listen, this is what I envision as a blue belt? Very rarely that's communicated to the student. 
there is some kind of a high level blue belt, you know, expectation, but rarely anybody talks about it. You know, I think there's a handful of instructors out there who've done a very good job with providing a list of techniques, list of expectations, a, a certain level of things that techniques or position or comprehension that is expected of each belt. But I would say 95, if not even more, acad- uh, percent academies, they don't do that. And it's even the ranking system is very much so shoot off the hip, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of the ranking, like you wisely pointed out there, changing your rank and getting promoted can have a a significant psychological impact on your students. And no one ever talks about this. Coaches very rarely tell their students what to expect. And it's odd because now that I think about it, pretty much every student who sticks around long enough, they're going to go through this cycle, right? The blue belt blues is a real thing. When you're a white belt, Blue belts, they're like gods to you, right? It's just, they're Uh like a level that you can't even comprehend, but then you train for not that long, a year, year and a half maybe, and you're probably going to get there. And now you don't look at blue belts as these just unkillable people. Now you are one of them. And suddenly now you're kind of moving into this category where you've got to deal with purple belts and brown belts and black belts. And they're starting to maybe pay more attention to you than you ever were. Now you've got just a different class of training partner. Now you're going to start seeing, you know, a lot of people who came in to train, maybe they only ever wanted to get their blue belt and they, you know, check that box. And so they leave. And then there's just also the, the fact that, you know, getting to a blue belt that's like a one or two year goal. But once you get to blue belt, man, you want to, you realize, man, if I want to complete this journey and get to black belt, I got to put in like another eight to 12 years here. I'm in here for a long haul. And I think that that can understandably depress a lot of people and they leave, right? Same thing happens at different belts. You know, people love to make fun of purple belts for not trying hard enough and skipping the warmups. You know, I think that the brown belt blues is something that a lot of people probably experience, but don't talk about enough. You know, when you are a brown belt and you're getting close to that black belt and you kind of look at what it means to be a black belt, most brown belts, you know, they don't really believe that they deserve that belt. They have a lot of self-doubt, kind of have a bit of an existential crisis in some cases. And coaches don't really prepare people for this. It would be really awesome, actually, if coaches would sit someone down and say, you know, look, we're thinking about giving you the blue belt and here's what to expect. Here's what that means and what you're probably going to experience and how you can be ready for that. Yeah, that's the hard part, right? It's the unclear expectations on each level to, you know, everybody teaching differently. So you go to Academy A and those expectations will be different. They will be taught differently, but perhaps the communication will be different. And then you go to Academy B and then, you know, the expectations and the whole system is completely different. So that's the difficult part behind all of this, you know, and I think the most visible one is the blue belt one, right? Is that's what we've been talking about. And it's simply because probably the most people experience that. So think about how many people get to that blue belt or at least get to think about that blue belt and how many people think about that brown belt. I mean, there's significantly smaller percentage of individuals to get to that level. I mean, you're talking about 80 years or so of hard grinding work versus a year and a half for that blue belt. So that, that that could be the one of the main reasons why it's so visible. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think you're right that instructors often don't really think about this. You know, they just think about, does this person know enough techniques? Are they competent enough at the grappling side to justify a promotion? Then you give them the promotion and that's that. What do you do at your academy if you've got someone who's got that fourth stripe on the white belt and it's almost time to give them the blue? It sounds like you've got a much more in-depth process than just, you know, you give them the belt and that's it. One, that process starts much sooner than that in my mind, in my academy. One, we do have certain expectations of of our students. You know, we have the curriculums and everything is filmed, available to them to access online so they can expand that education off the mat is not necessarily connected to the limited time that you might have to being on the mat due to the lifestyle or the expectations you have outside of the academy. But at the same time, the moment you start, you get that third stripe, the conversations begin. And this is not only a, a white belt limited, same thing happens on a, on a blue belt, you know, when you creeping up to that purple and Definitely same thing happens towards the brown belt. And I tell you, the toughest conversations are when you are brown, midway into that brown, 
and the thoughts are start coming up about the black belt. My academy is fairly new, fairly young in its existence, but we've had those conversations on every single level. And I believe that as much as instructor is willing and ready to reward that belt, it is extremely important that a student is able and willing to receive it. You know, I, I think even though it is ultimately the instructor's decision to reward the rank to a student, I think it's important that student mentally is prepared for it. And I'm not saying that necessarily my students know exactly when they will be rewarded with that black belt, but I'll tell you, every single one who's getting promoted, they do know that that's coming up. There is no surprise. You do have four stripes on your blue belt or your white belt. Let's talk about this. What is going to take you to the next level? This is what I will be expecting of a blue belt, you know, who fits into the categories that you find yourself in. This is the areas that I see that you should be improving. This is the areas that you should be focusing. Perhaps sparring four times a week is not the, not the objective here. Maybe we need to spend more time drilling. Maybe comprehending of a specific system or working on your defense mechanisms right here, this will take you to the next level, right? So again, going back to that systemizing of, of the jujitsu itself, but also providing clear expectations for those students. The tricky part about this, I'll tell you, Steve, is the fact that not only it's difficult to track this, not only the expectations always are not clear to all of the students, but also... We have students who are 20 years old, and we have students who are 55 years old. And the million-dollar question is, should we expect the same thing from a 25-year-old as we're expecting from a 55-year-old? That's the million-dollar question in jiu-jitsu. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm so glad you brought that up. I remember I started training jujitsu at one school and got to about three stripes on my blue belt and decided to switch schools. And I remember the instructor telling me when I told him I was leaving, he said, Steve, if you want to be on the top of the podium, you got to stay at our school. If you go to another school, you're just never going to be at the top of the podium. Our place is the place to be. And I was thinking to myself, you see, buddy, this is one of the reasons I'm leaving. I'm a hobbyist, right? I train jujitsu for fun. I have no interest in competing. I'm not here for the reasons you think I am. If we were better aligned, maybe we wouldn't be having this conversation now, but I found an instructor who is better aligned with me. And I think that what you've so wisely brought up here is that there is massive diversity in the, the student base of jujitsu, right? It's not all 20 something dudes who want to be world champions, although that's obviously a big part of it. People have wildly different goals. And kind of one of the funny things about jujitsu, and you talked about this, right? You talked about how a belt might be awarded based on not whether someone quote unquote deserves it in an absolute sense, but more on based on what they're trying to achieve. And that's one of the really weird things about jujitsu is that we all come into this with wildly different goals and reasons to be here, but we all get belted and ranked the exact same way. I mean, I'm technically the same rank as Gordon Ryan, right? That's absurd when you think about it. I mean, I have no business even being put on the same scale as someone who does this professionally, especially at that level. But yet, according to the belt system, we're both the same. And I think that that's one of the things that does make jujitsu a little bit tricky for people sometimes is everyone comes in here for different reasons, but that one weird measuring stick, the color on your belt, we're all going to wind up wearing the same belt anyway at the end of the day if we stay around long enough. So how do you square that away? You know, that's, that's the big question. I think that, you know, we've been scratching our heads on for, for a while, and I think we'll continue scratching our heads until there is one overseeing body and making decisions for the entire jiu-jitsu community, as you see in other sports, I think this will be very difficult to answer. And so if you look at, I don't know, other martial arts, taekwondo, karate, judo, there is a national judo federation and there's international judo federation, and then you have Olympic Judo Federation. Each of them have a different focus, different function. However, there are a set of rules that is being applied down from these organizations to everybody who belongs to them. None of that exists in Jiu-Jitsu. So we have IBJJF who is doing, I think, good job 
trying to systemize this from a rank perspective, but they are not the only one. And honestly, not everybody belongs to IBJJF. Then you have other organizations like ADCC coming and doing phenomenal job promoting professional jiu-jitsu, but the ranks really have nothing to do with it. So like you have so many cooks in the kitchen, in my opinion, that it's very difficult to come up with rules, regulations, or even a suggestion, if you will, how to tackle the ranking system because everybody does it their own way. And it, just like you pointed out, one one instructor will be hyper-focused on competition aspect of jiu-jitsu and his ranking system will be 100% targeted towards that, which means very likely students will be promoted slightly slower to give them an opportunity to have you know, to be on the mat and competing and challenging themselves in some of these big organizations and big tournaments. Now, you have another academy who might be a little bit more hobbyist focused. You know, his approach to to ranking will be completely different. Matter of fact, his expectations of the knowledge that students have very likely will be very different than the competition school down the street. So I think these challenges will continue existing. We're not going to answer these questions today or tomorrow or a year from now. I think until there is some kind of overseeing set of rules and regulations, we'll continue tackling this. Now, the, the big question is, do we want somebody regulating all of this? You know, like we can't talk about this topic without highlighting the fact that big, beautiful part about jiu-jitsu is this flowing, free-spirited almost approach to jiu-jitsu. Is that's how jiu-jitsu has been presented. That's how it is being viewed today, even though we often complain about these things that, you know, there's no expectations. It's very difficult to rank people. It's very difficult for students to achieve specific goals. very difficult to measure that. Yet, part of jiu-jitsu culture, part of jiu-jitsu existence is this free-flowing attitude, if you will, is this free-flowing body that that we all find ourselves in. None of this exists in judo or karate or taekwondo. Everything's very rigid. Everything is is very, you know, lined up. Either you it's black and white that you meet the requirements or you don't. You know, so it's it's a very interesting topic to to chat about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that one of the things about jujitsu that is so unique is that free flowing relaxed nature of it. And that is actually one of the things that I think draws so many people to it. You get a lot of people who are not, you know, hard-nosed combat athletes who train jiu-jitsu. There's a lot of mums and dads and hobbyists and people who don't have a violent bone in their body, but this is just their fun activity to blow off steam. And you run the risk of losing those people or alienating those people if you try to turn this into a very rigidly structured combat sport. One of the beautiful things about jiu-jitsu is the fact that it's kind of like half combat sport, half lifestyle in a lot of ways. It's got a lot in common with yoga or surfing. And I think that is one of the things that attracts people to it, that kind of relaxed chilled out sort of meditative attitude that jujitsu people have is one of the beautiful things about it. And I would worry that if you tried to turn this into a very regimented, rigorous sport, that you might lose some of those people. And those are the people that I think make jujitsu really interesting. I, I will go on the edge. And I'll, in my opinion, the moment we do turn this into a very rigid environment, we will lose 90% of students. I mean, look at wrestling, one of the most popular sports there is. And look at the age demographic that exists within wrestling community. I don't know the exact statistics, but it's in twenties, teens and twenties. You don't see adults wrestling, do you? I mean, I don't know, maybe, but like that's a very small percentage. Look at judo, highly impact driven sport, very visually appealing. Part of why it's so successful in the Olympics. People love just watching others throw each other. But yeah, the age demographic is significantly lower than jiu-jitsu. My oldest student is is in his 70s. I cannot imagine him doing judo or wrestling. It's simply because it's like these roles simply will turn people away. And this fluidity, what you mentioned, lifestyle approach won't exist at that point. And as as a result of that, jiu-jitsu could get turned into, into what we see in some of the other sports. So it's not so cookie cutter, in my opinion. It's we can improve jujitsu. We can make it better. 
But we, I think we need to be very careful as this goes on for it not to become what we see in, in, in other sports. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you something about how we measure success here. Yeah. You talked about how in jujitsu, you get people from all walks of life, you get older people. It's not just all young athletes who come in and do this, which again, I think is one of the things that makes it interesting. But one of the things that's interesting then is you get some people who train and honestly, I'm not really sure if their number one goal is to actually be good at jujitsu. And I would include myself in this category now. Uh, when I got into jujitsu, like many young men at the time, I started this sport because I wanted to learn to defend myself and to build confidence and to be a martial artist, right? And that lasted for a while. But, you know, eventually as you get older, you kind of realize, okay, like when you're older, it becomes less and less likely that you're going to wind up getting into, you know, street fights and having to defend yourself. But so your motivations can change, right? And so my motivations have changed over, over time as well. When I started, you know, it was all about being able to defend myself and being fit. And then it kind of changed towards, okay, I want to use jujitsu as a vehicle for skill development. But if you ask me now why I train, I'm not even sure it's that important to me to actually be good at jujitsu anymore. I do it because it's fun. It's, it's a social endeavor. It's an opportunity to meet people, to talk to people, you know, honestly, like after the pandemic, right, I work mostly remote. If not for jujitsu, I'd barely leave the house, right? So jujitsu for me is like, it's a social thing. It's, it's a hobby. It's a practice that to me is more important than even getting better. And I think for a lot of hobbyists, they're like that. You know, there's a point of good enough. Everyone always is obsessed about what's going on at the highest levels and, you know, can you beat world-class athletes? But I think for a lot of jujitsu people, that's not what they actually want out of the sport. And I would want to hear your opinion on this. I mean, is it okay for people to want to train and not really even have get good at jujitsu be their number one goal? Well, I think jujitsu has few aspects that, you know, we encounter as we step on the mat. And the technical aspect of it is definitely very present at the very beginning, simply because we don't know anything. We're stepping into this room where there's a bunch of other people who train there all better than me. And I, one, I want to be as good as them, but two, it's very stimulating to learn new things. You know, and we fail, we succeed, and there are some wins and there are some failures and so on, but it all that drives us forward. At some point, and it comes different points for different people, but at some point is what we call plateaus. And I personally don't believe in plateaus. I think it's just we simply bored. We our focus changed. We are no longer interested in what's expected of us or what we expected of ourselves, and we simply lose interest. And then we find on other points to focus on. And because jujitsu takes so long, just like you mentioned, it's almost, if not almost, it is a lifestyle for many people. I think that technical aspect of jujitsu, and what I mean by this, continuously evolving yourself, continuously learning, continuously measuring how good you are with all of this becomes a second nature or second priority, I should say. It kind of puts it, we put on a back burner, you know, and we already know enough to be good at it, but we don't have that drive to go above and beyond. We don't go, we don't push ourselves. And this could be one of the reasons why you see a lot of black belts actually hanging out the belt. You know, they achieve their level of black belt, they achieve that rank, and then it's like, well, you know, in order for me to learn, now I have to either invest significant amount of time into instructionals, or I have to invest in significant amounts of time in some kind of one-on-one -on -one session with somebody who is much better than me, or perhaps financial investment into seminars or traveling. In either case, this becomes by far more complex than what it used to be, right? When we are in the beginning stages of, of the journey, I think it's very simple in a sense of that everybody's better than us. Whether you're white, blue, or purple, well, there's plenty of people around you who are better than us, so we can look up to them, we can steal their information, we can ask questions, we can get the answers, we can continue troubleshooting. The higher we get, I think that the fact of us not being challenged is becoming more and more and more visible. And I think that's one of the reasons why the focus changes. And there's nothing wrong with focus changing, but I think we do have to ask ourselves is 
why in the world are we doing this? Why, what's driving us? What's the purpose? Why am I doing this? You know, and if the social component is part of it, then let it be, you know? But at the moment, I think when we lose purpose, that's why things become a little shady. That's a really good point. And it's funny because when you're a, a junior belt, you kind of assume, or at least I assumed when I was a junior belt, you kind of assume that once someone gets to like purple belt or, or above, they're a lifer. They're never going to quit. I mean, I remember talking to people about this when I was younger and just thinking, man, well, you know, once you get to purple belt, you're basically over the hump and you're going to be doing this for the rest of your life. But I'm not sure if that's true. I mean, recently, I'm aware of two black belts I know who have basically decided to mostly, if not entirely, hang it up and just move on to other things in their life just because they lost interest or something else came up that they enjoyed doing more or they just had other priorities and got really busy. And, you know, when someone says that, when someone says I'm too busy, what they're really saying is I have priorities that for me are higher than jujitsu. And that's okay. That's absolutely okay to have changing life priorities. And we should all always be reassessing my priorities. But I just found that to be kind of an interesting realization because, you know, when I was coming up, I'd always assumed that if you put 10 plus years of your life into this to get to black belt, your goal was to stick around for the long term. But yeah, I, I realized that even black belts aren't immune from that and from drifting off and changing priorities and leaving the belt behind at some point. You know, I had recently, I had a conversation with a friend of mine and yeah, him and I, we've been on the mat for a very, very, very long time. And he brought up a very eye-opening point and it turned into a long conversation. But essentially the digest was that there was two pivotal points in one's jujitsu. One is the blue belt and the second one is the black belt. And it doesn't mean there is not other milestones around or between them, but those two have the biggest impact. And here was a thought behind this. When you are a white belt, you're starting this. The blue belt is the first major milestone that one can achieve. We love stripes. We love submissions. We love the things that we learn. But the blue belt often is the goal that we hunt. We don't want to be the white belt. We don't want to be the beginner. We want to have the color. And the color is the first big thing that we get. And many, unfortunately, many, the moment they achieve this, they lose the passion. They just don't see another reason to continue. Because I just put out a year and a half or a year or two years, depending where you work for what you do, into this thing. I got my blue belt. Darn it. Now I have to wait another 10 years to get to that black belt. Now that is very, very far away. And a lot of people, this could be a reason why a lot of people hang up at that point. Now, once you get to that purple, and you mentioned it yourself, that purple is like the middle ground, like that you, you, it's more is behind you than in front of you. And I think a lot of people push through this. You know, they push through that purple, they push through that brown belt with the goal to get to that black belt. But the moment they achieve that black belt, this is that desire point. This is the moment where everybody wants to be at. And very often we realize that that black belt is just a beginning. This is really where like, you really have understanding of what is happening and true work is actually ahead of us. This is where we got to continue working. Nothing ends. We not wake up and have a huge wisdom. Nothing really changed. We're just continuing that journey. And perhaps that might be the second reason why people, or that might be the reason why people give up or hang up or take a quote unquote break or others' priorities come up because they don't see the desire to continue as a black belt. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny you bring all this up because I remember when I was a white belt and I was getting close to my blue belt. I remember it wasn't that I was excited about getting my blue belt. It was that I was excited about not being a white belt anymore, right? Yep. Because you know what that means, right? When you're a white belt, you're the newbie, you're the bottom of the barrel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, you know, there's different degrees of stripes, but honestly, you're still a white belt. Once you get to the blue belt, you've checked that box, right? Going to purple and brown is not really that meaningful if your goal was, I just don't want to be a white belt anymore. And if your goal is self-defense, I mean, if you're a blue belt, you're already going to be like a god compared to most of the people out there who don't train. So for many people, they've already checked those boxes and they leave. And I, 
you know, the thing that I'm, I'm realizing is we shouldn't necessarily judge those people because look, if someone's goal was just, I don't want to be a white belt, I want to get competent and that's good enough. And then I'm going to move on. I mean, all the power to them. That's what their choice. That's what they can do. And I don't think we should necessarily judge them for that. But I would definitely want to hear from a coach's perspective. You know, what do you do here in, in this regard? Is this a concern that we should be mindful of? You know, people basically quitting at certain belt levels. Is that something that a coach should be really thinking about? Or is that just a fact of life and we should just be okay with it and just kind of roll with the punches? You know, I th- I'll tell you this. I think it's in my mind, this is my personal view. One, it is disappointing. I think it's disappointing. And a lot of instructors won't admit that, but I think it is. It is disappointing to see blue belts quit or anybody for that matter. But I think that blue belt is often very visible because it happens the most frequently. And again, you bring up a good point. Like we shouldn't judge people because they don't want to continue. Matter of the fact, I think if you honest with yourself, and I think if you set those priority points in your life, and you are very clear about them, there is there shouldn't be any judgment. I think where the wishy washy area is coming in, where you hear students talking about it, jiu jitsu is very important to me. I want to continue doing this. No, 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 no. I'm going to continue doing this. However, you don't see them training. You don't see them appearing. They disappear, you know, and especially it's, if it's immediately after that promotion, I think it is disappointing to some of the instructors. So should we judge? No, absolutely not. And I think you brought up a very good point. The whole factor of I don't have time is nothing but excuse that we give ourselves. There's nothing wrong with having other priorities than jujitsu. Matter of fact, I tell my students, jujitsu shouldn't be the most important part of your life. Your family should be more important than jiu-jitsu. Your career should be more important than jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu should be the outlet, the vehicle where we can, you know, stimulate our minds, we can stimulate our bodies, we can come and hang out with our peers, we can have this bond and community. That's what jiu-jitsu is, but it's definitely not the most important part. But the moment you start saying that jiu-jitsu is the most important part in your life, yet you don't show up, or you quote unquote, don't have time for it. I think this is where we begin to lie to ourselves essentially. And we're trying to duct tape the situation and often does not lead into us continuing, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. There's a lot of people who will say one thing about the importance of jujitsu, but their actions don't necessarily align with that. And again, you know, no judgment to someone who has more important priorities in life. But I do think it's important to just admit that to yourself. I mean, if look, I've talked to people who have had to walk away from jujitsu because other priorities came up. And you know what? Knowing their situation, if I were in their shoes, I would have absolutely abandoned jujitsu as well, because I agree with them that the things that they're focusing on are, are higher priority. But I also take your point that, you know, from a coach's perspective, it's always going to be disappointing if someone leaves your gym and quits, especially if it could have been prevented by better goal alignment to begin with. And is that something that you and your academy, you think about? I mean, do you have these kinds of conversations with your students where you you talk to them about what their goals actually are and you kind of plan around that? It's something that can be hard to do simply because of the amount of time involved in tracking all of that. It may not be realistic, but I would love to know if that's something that you consider and when you're talking to your students, if you take into account what their own goals are and try to kind of help steer them in the direction that'll achieve what they need. Yeah, I think knowing your students is a very important and knowing them on a personal level gives you this point of empathy and connection relationship, but also knowing what their goals are and what they want to do is extremely important to their success on the mat. So again, having, I don't know, 30 or 40 year old mom who has no desire to compete and you pushing her into a competition class is going to lead to nothing but failure. This is a complete recipe for disaster. Now, at the same time, you have a 25-year-old young man who has full desire to compete with huge goals in his jiu-jitsu path, and you put him in a very basic self-defense class with no goals or expectations for growth. It will be nothing but failure, right? So even though I think all students do start at the same point, which is 
zero and we are starting up. We are learning something new. And I do believe that everybody should know a basic ways of defending themselves. I think at some point within between the year and the two-year mark, I think that path slowly starting to shape. Slowly. You're starting to notice what the interests are. Some guys want to spar more. Some guys want to have a little bit more physical engagement. You're noticing other guys, they come into the comprehension classes where techniques are broken down and minuscule steps and understanding balance and, and leverage and, and gravity is his focus. Like you start noticing those things. You have others who attend six classes a day and you have another person who attends only two. And making those notes in your mind or somehow cataloging, and I think it's critical to every instructor. Obviously, this gets more difficult and complex. More students you have and more instructors you have, that transparency slowly starts fading away. And I think that's the difficult part, right? But at the same time, more you know your students, more success you can give them. And I think being very honest and transparent with these guys is extremely important. I'll tell you a quick story here. I, shout out to my student, Adam, but he's been at it for you know, a few years now. And then in the past year and a half, actually since pandemic, I think he started, you know, it, it's been difficult for him. It's been difficult. Career change and other things and priorities in his home. And him and I, we had many conversations and even got to the point where I was simply very honest with him and say, listen, are you sure you want to continue this? Like, I don't want to be. And his answer was, listen, I might not show up. I might not, you know, be the best with attendance, but I'm telling you, you cannot give up on me. I want you to text me. I want you, like, you are the reason why I'm still coming in and I am coming in. And it's so interesting because sometimes I feel bad texting him. <laughs> but every time I do, he shows up. He comes in with a smile on his face and he says, thank you. Thank you. I'm here because you text me. And that is huge. And that right there is a reason why that personal connection is so important. Yeah, I love that. I have definitely felt that myself as well. There have been times, and I mean, this is something too that another thing that people don't prepare their students for, no matter how good you are at jujitsu or how dedicated you are, your enthusiasm will wax and wane. It's not always going to be as intense a relationship that you have with jujitsu as it was when you started it and discovered it for the first time. It's kind of like a honeymoon phase, right? When people discover jujitsu, they get uh -huh. super obsessed with it for the first bit. But then, I mean, you do anything that you love long enough and you're going to have down periods where your motivation just isn't there. That's just inevitable with any kind of relationship, right? And having a long-term relationship with anything, whether it be jujitsu or a person, <laughs> it's all about kind of weathering the good and the bad and just having it be, you know, more good than bad at the end of the day. But understanding there's going to be periods of kind of boredom and, you know, when, just when things are kind of feeling off. I've had that and I had the same experience with my instructor where, you know, I, I took two weeks off and I got a check-in message from him and I really appreciated it. I was actually very flattered that he even noticed I was gone. And it meant a lot to me that he took the time to reach out because the gym that I'd left prior to this instructor, I knew for certain they probably wouldn't have even noticed if I stopped showing up, right? So when an instructor takes the time to notice a student and to actually check in with them unannounced, that is a huge validation to that student. I think it's a great practice. And it's something that, you know, in terms of easy, quick wins that any instructor can do to improve the culture at their gym and also to increase retention, man, like if you haven't seen someone or heard from someone in a few weeks, check in on them. It's going to make a world of difference because you don't know why they disappeared, right? It could have been because they've got some terrible personal problem and having them check in it really matters. It really can make a difference to people. So that is one thing that I, I would suggest most instructors start doing, which is active reach outs to check in with students who just haven't been around in the last while. I think that's critical. I think that's critical. Again, life happens. Jiu-Jitsu is not the most important in most people's lives, right? So it's very easy for that, for that one day, I'm going to take a night off because I can't go to turn into two, three, five days, seven days, 14 days, 30 days, and so on. So getting that acknowledgement from instructors is critical. I think that one of the challenges that a lot of instructors face is, you know, when you have 20 students, it's very easy to notice who is not there. When you have 200 or 300 or 500 students, it's almost impossible 
to notice one person who disappeared. So having some mechanics, some some systems in place that can help you with this and really noticing, you know, that your students are not coming, are, it's critical. It's critical to to their success and honestly to to their retention, to to continue building that community within your academy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, man, we covered a lot here today. Thomas, before we tie this up, was there anything else you wanted to share, just relevant tips or stories or anything that you think would help other instructors learn how to to maximize the success for the students or alternately things that students could do to take ownership and maximize their own success? I I think both of those, if you've got any uh, other gems of wisdom, I definitely want to share them here before we close this off. Absolutely. Listen, I think technology is a huge benefit and a curse at the same time that we are dealing with these days, you know, is the environment we surround ourselves in. Even having ability to talk to you remotely across, you know, several thousand miles is is a very convenient factor. At the same time, you know, oftentimes we use technology for a wrong purpose, for a wrong reason. So we scroll through Instagrams looking at techniques and it's simply a waste of time. I highly encourage students. If you're going to use technology, use it the right way. You know, invest into instructionals. Make notes. Make notes. I'm a huge fan of journaling. Daily, weekly, it doesn't matter. But put your thoughts on a paper. That's huge. And the second or third of that, I guess, big point that I always encourage my students is film yourself. Film yourself. And not every academy allows that. I understand all of this. But when you do have an opportunity to simply pull your phone up, and record yourself what you are doing you will be mind blown with what you see on the video and what you thought was happening this happens almost every tournament at my academy i tell all my students film yourself i want to see your performance i don't want to hear what you thought we'll analyze this the moment we'll be watching it together and almost every time it happens when the student says, I was doing blah, 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 and we're watching the video, and it's like, no, no, you were really not doing that. This You were doing something else, and it's not that you're doing something wrong. The point is that what you think is happening does not always happen. Our bodies react differently than our brain processes information, and this, again, goes into understanding how human brains work, but it's what we feel is not always what's happening around us. And having visual of that is really, really mind opening and eye opening when it comes to technicalities of jujitsu. You can very easily correct and improve things the moment you find your mistakes. So, what do they say? Step one of correcting any mistakes is acknowledging there is one. Otherwise, we got nothing to fix. So, again, using technology and journaling are big points for that I highlight for all of my students. Yeah, yeah. Both fantastic pieces of advice. We actually just a few weeks ago had black belt Rachel Ranshaw under Andre Gavau. She was on the podcast talking specifically about note taking, which I think is such a great tool. I mean, even if you never go back and consult the notes again, the act of putting your ideas onto paper Uh kind of forces you to organize and clarify your thinking in a way that it's just very hard to do if it's just stuff floating around in your brain. And yeah, regarding filming yourself, I can't emphasize to people how much of a game changer this is. I think for a lot of competitors, they probably already know this because if you're competing, there's a very good chance that you got your stuff on film and you've seen yourself spar before. But there's a lot of hobbyists who just have never filmed themselves. And man, let me tell you, Take the time to do it because you are going to be shocked at what you see. You will learn that the way that you move is not the way that you think you move. Probably the best relatable example I can give to people is, you know how when you record your voice and you play it back and everyone, when they hear themselves talk, they think, oh man, is that what I sound like? That's awful. I hope I don't sound like that. I'm embarrassed, right? Everyone learns a lot about the way that they speak from listening to themselves talk. In fact, because I've had to do this podcast for so long, and I'm sure you're in the same boat, I have made significant changes to the way that I speak because I I listened to myself back and I thought, oh my God, is that what I sound like? I I can't be talking like this. I got to change myself. Same thing with tape study. One of the things that we do on our premium service is if you sign up, we've got an amazing black belt review team who will take your footage and they'll break it down and narrate it for you. And so many people, this is the first time they've ever 
had their their video footage reviewed and the feedback i always hear is like i i was blown away by how useful that was even if it's just like a three minute rolling clip to have someone sit down and analyze it and point out what you did in detail like it's more valuable than any instructional you'll get because there's nothing truer than seeing yourself move and it's going to open your eyes to so many problems like you said that you simply can't fix if you don't even know they exist so yeah both of those fantastic pieces of advice and i I would suggest that everyone hobbyist you know competitor white belt black belt everyone should do both of those things note take and record video at least once in a while so that you can get some real feedback and you can organize your thoughts too right very helpful pointers so thank you for sharing those absolutely a matter of fact i do this with all most of my private lessons you know not only they get homework to go and work between the sessions, but also I do ask them to record it and send me the footage so I can analyze it for them and I can provide a tangible feedback of not only what they change as part of their homework, but also how they are physically doing while they are training. So unquestionably phenomenal way of using the technology. Well, Thomas, if people want to learn more about you, check out your podcast, check out your academy, How can they contact you, follow you, learn more about you? Feel free to plug your stuff. I'll put the links in the show notes, but uh, let's hear it from you first. You know, the easiest way to get in touch with me is Instagram. If you search for R-O-Z-D-Z, you'll find me. I'm the only guy with so many Z's in the last name, so it's easy to find me. You know, podcast is another way. We we take a, a storytelling approach to talk to particularly some of the old school guys in Jiu Jitsu, Dirty Dozen and others. But also the new age guys, and we're getting, you know, their perspective on philosophy on and off the mat and so on. So check out the Row Radio. You can find quite interesting conversations there. Awesome. Yeah, I am well aware of your work and I'm happy to plug it here. So for those who didn't quite catch that or maybe on the go and you want to check out that stuff, I I do this with every episode, but just go into the show notes here. It'll be in your podcast player, probably under info or details or something like that. There will be links to all of that stuff. So if you want to connect with Thomas or follow him on Instagram, or if you want to check out his amazing podcast, quick links in there, easy to follow. I'll also put in links to BJJ Mental Models in there. I always do. So for those who don't know, in terms of the free stuff, probably the there's three main reasons why you would come here. One, of course, is the podcast. The other is our database of concepts. And the other is our awesome newsletter. All of those are free and all of them are on our website. So the address is just bjjmentalmodels.com. Again, I'll put a link in the show notes. And if you want to check out our premium stuff, that's also where you would go to do it. So BJJ Mental Models Premium, it is the thing that keeps this show afloat. It is the thing that prevents you from having to listen to Blue Chew ads and Dollar Shave Club ads. That is ultimately how we monetize this. But we always try to make it super worthwhile. I mean, my belief, and of course I'm biased, is that it's the best subscription service that you can get in the space. I offer a free trial so you can call bullshit on me, try it out for free. If you disagree, just cancel. You won't get charged a thing. Um, There's basically three main reasons you would want to join. One is the massive premium content library. It is the only library of its kind that I'm aware of. It's a ton of long form audio style masterclasses with some of the best and brightest minds in the sport. Additionally, there's the coaching service that I talked about earlier. If you're a premium member, send us your rolling footage and our black belt review team will break it down. And when I say black belt review team, I'm talking about a review team that includes Margot Ciccarelli, Dominica Oblanite, Rory Van Vliet, Emily Kwok, Brianna St. Marie. It's a stacked review team. It's an amazing value. And then, of course, there's also our awesome community. Our community is great. It's a reason why some people actually sign up just to get in the community. So, again, another amazing benefit. So, please do check it out if you haven't already. BJJMentalModels.com or alternately just pop open the show notes and there's a link there. But thanks a lot to everyone who subscribes, of course. Thanks a lot to everyone who listens to us every week. And Thomas, big thanks to you for coming by. I mean, I really enjoyed this conversation. I think you've got a fascinating way of communicating and speaking on the philosophy of coaching. So, man, you've always got a a platform here if you want to come by again. But thank you so much for this conversation. Steve, thank you for having me. It was great chatting with you and we'll talk soon. You too, man. And same to the listeners. Great chatting with you. Thanks for hanging around. We'll talk to you soon too. Take care. Thank you.